look like you're talking to the microphone. All right, okay. <laughs> Thank you. We have a lot of pictures. I, I didn't realize that part of, part of your job was sartorial. Why are you, why are you picking he asked. Yes. I need help. <laughs> As you know. Is this oh, so exciting? I've never done anything like this before. This is so cool. Do you have a what? I've never done anything like this before. Yeah. This is so I, cool. Are you, are you up there? there. Westchester. Thank you for coming down. Absolutely. Okay. Oh. He went to change his Hello, everyone. How are you doing tonight? Uh, I'm Mark Nowak. Uh, I'm the director of the Worker Writers School. Uh, we have offered now in our ninth year uh, monthly creative writing workshops. Monthly creative writing workshops uh, in collaboration with a number of worker centers around New York City. Uh, our longest uh, collaborator has been Domestic Workers United, who we've been working with for the beginning of our ninth year now. Uh, also with members of the New York Taxi Worker Federation, the Retail Action Project, uh, the Mayan Migrant uh, Workers Association, Picture the Homeless, uh, and some other organizations. So twice a year, uh, we do events that we try to open up uh, what we do to the public. The first one uh, happens here for the last couple of years at the People's Forum, so thank you all for showing up for this. Uh, the second big event we do every year uh, is with our longest collaborators at PEN America, uh, and we do readings at the end of the year in April or May during the PEN World Voices Festival, where members from all of those worker organizations come out and give readings uh, at places like the CUNY Graduate Center and uh, New Eurekan Poets Cafe and all the great kind of literary institutions around the city. So I'm not gonna say too much more about that, but if you wanna stay up with everything we do, please follow us at Worker Writers on Twitter. Uh, and I'm gonna turn the microphone over to my colleague at Manhattanville College, Nikki Joseph, whose classroom I seem to walk into every week. <laughs> yeah. Do I need both? This is interesting. Oh, <laughs> one final thing is that when we get to the Q&A period, uh, I'm gonna jump up with this microphone because People's Forum is live streaming the event uh, so that people who are at home could make it out, et cetera, can still watch and listen in. So when we get to the Q&A, just wait for me to jump up with the microphone. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mark. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We're going to jump right in because we don't have a lot of time, and we have two magnificent authors I know you'd like to hear a lot from. So let me introduce Eli Meyerhoff, our author and scholar of Beyond Education, Radical Studying for Another World, and of course, Bill Ayers, who also has a new book out about becoming a teacher. So we'll start with Eli, who wants to give us a little bit about some of those major arguments from your new book. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming out. So I'm going to talk a little about my book, and tell you the, the main arguments of the book, um, and then Bill will give a little response, and then we'll open it up, and, and I'll facil facilitate a little discussion um, where you all can talk with each other about your ideas mm. around radical studying. So this book, Beyond Education, um, why did I write it? So I, I was in grad school for a long time, about 10 years, 
And somewhere along the way, I, I snapped. I, I snapped at the university. I, and I decided to write my dissertation, which became this book, as a way to investigate why academia was so messed up. So before I talk about my snap, I want to share two stories from other people who also snapped at the university. So on, on June 13th, 2016, Corey Menefee decided the window had to go. During his work break, this 38-year-old African-American service worker at Yale University's Calhoun College dining hall used a broomstick to smash a stained glass window that depicted enslaved people of African descent. The building was named after the slaveholder and colonialist John C. Calhoun. After he was arrested and charged with a felony, Menefee resigned from Yale, and he gave several interviews with local and national news outlets. The nationwide outcry against Yale pressured them to drop the charges and to rehire him. But they did so only on the condition of a gag provision, preventing Menefee from making any further statements to the public about his action and the administrative response. The Yale administration sought to bury the controversy that Menefee's act and his speaking about it had brought into the public spotlight. Yale's vice president of communications claimed the reason for the gag provision was so that, quote, everyone can now move on. Feminist scholar Sarah Ahmed also snapped at her university. After building up frustration over years, in 2016, she publicly called out academia's sexism, especially the sexual harassment of students by professors, trying to grapple with all the complex controversies raised by many, many different intersecting struggles from student and faculty movements organizing against increased tuition, debt, corporatization, and adjunctification, to mo movements around Me Too, Black Lives Matter, and solidarity with Standing Rock and Palestine on campuses. So thinking about the impasse of all of these different kinds of controversies raised by all these different struggles, you can engage this, um, these problems in a lot of different ways. But I, I found that the most people who are writing about higher education politics tended to talk about the problems with universities um, with a narrative of crisis, talking about universities as being in crisis. Um, and I, I find that this, this, this crisis narrative t tends to treat um, the impasse as a kind of moral question. Nar narratives of crisis imply a kind of moral distinction between past and future, posing the question, where, where did we go wrong? And I also found that these, these narratives of crisis tended to be um, populated with characters from a, a romantic story of education, a kind of heroic individual ascending up education levels from kindergarten through the grades, up through 12th grade, up higher to higher education, and o overcoming challenges along the way at each level in this romantic narrative. So I, I see this kind of education romance as part of what I call an epistemology of educated ignorance, or way, ways of knowing that suppress critical questions about education that might challenge one's own position in the, in the education system. I, I found that this romance of education tends to pr provide an escape from engaging with the complex controversies around higher education. So, I use my book as a kind of antidote to this problem. And I argue that we should, we should think about education as one mode of studying, one mode of studying among alternatives, alternative modes of studying, alternatives to education. So, so to think about education as a particular mode of studying, we, we need to look at its, its different elements. So you can think of education as having a kind of imagined trajectory, a vertical trajectory of an individual rising up these levels of grades up to higher education and a kind of romantic narrative of, of a hero overcoming challenges along the way. Another element of education is that um, students tend to be separated from their, their resources for studying, their means of studying and their relationship with those resources is mediated by, a te by teachers and administrators. 
Also, ed education tends to be a kind of ideology for preparing students to be governed. Another element is that um, knowledge tends to be seen from a kind of zero point um, expertise as, as a kind of um, uh, way of understanding the world that's produced from a, a zero point floating above the world, abstracted from many particular bodies and places. Another element is that um, education relies on a kind of pedagogy of credits and debts that can take the form of graded exams. And finally, a key element of education is um, binary or dichotomous figures of waste and value, which uh, most prevalently in the US takes the, the form of a binary between a, a dropout and a graduate. So, so looking at, at um, education from this perspective as, as one, one mode of study among alternatives, um, we, can, we can see the impasse around higher education as rooted in political questions instead of moral questions. So these political questions are about conflicts between alternative modes of studying that are associated with alternative ways of making the world. Yet I, I, I found that um, throughout history, education has been presented as, as if it is the best and only mode of studying. And because education has been romanticized in this way, the possibility of thinking about alternative modes of study has become almost unthinkable. And yet, alternatives have existed before and concurrently with education. For example, indigenous modes of studying, um, such as practiced by many different Native American and First Nations peoples, Okay, a good book on um, thinking about indigenous modes of studying is a book called As We Have Always Done by Leanne Simpson. Um, she talks about um, indigenous ways of studying um, in terms of a kind of grounded relationship with the land, where the land itself is a kind of pedagogy and um, learning, learning happens through um, reciprocal uh, ways of re relating between people and the land. Universities have also been terrains, terrains between different conflicting modes of study and world making. And this has been seen through movements for radical kinds of disciplines on campuses like black studies and women's studies, feminist studies, indigenous studies. So if we, if we think about universities as concentrations of the means and resources for studying, then we can see them as terrains of struggle for access to and control of those means by different movements, different movements that are, are trying to create alternative ways of making the world. So, so in the rest of my book, I, I give um, a kind of genealogy or, or history, critical history, of how the different elements of education have emerged contingently out of political struggles particularly as reactions to people's struggles for liberation that have been bound up with alternative modes of studying and world making. So I'll, I'll, in the rest of my talk here, I'll just give a, a quick taste of, of each of those histories. So, so I look at um, this idea of the school dropout and I ask where this came from historically. So in the, in the early 1950s, a majority of Americans started graduating from high school Yet at that time, har hardly anybody talked about school dropouts as a national problem. I found that the, the origins of the dropout problem narrative were in the early 1960s in the US with the, um, the political project of racial liberalism, which was, was promoted by liberal establishment institutions, particularly the Ford Foundation and the National Education Association. They had, they had this project that was called Project School Dropouts. So, so why, why were they promoting this narrative? So in the early 1960s, um, late 1950s, early 1960s, liberal capitalists perceived threats from both the right and the left, from the right, from um, uh, the anti-communist witch hunts that tried to um, paint liberals as communists um, because they were promoting desegregation. Um, but the liberals also face threats from the left, from actual communists, and from the civil rights movement and anti-colonial movements, as well as from 
um, migrants who uh, didn't, didn't necessarily have any uh, left or right political valence, um, especially domestic migration of African Americans from the South to the Northern and Western cities. So, so in reaction to these threats, liberal capitalists created color, so-called colorblind institutions that addressed what they called urban problems. And one of these urban problems they defined as the dropout problem. This dropout project um, focused on domestic migration to so-called gray areas between the inner cities and suburbs. And um, people who were promoting this project, especially the Ford Foundation, avoided talking about racism explicitly by instead focusing on this deracialized figure of the migrant, which lumped together black, brown, and poor white migrants. They, they denigrated these migrants by framing them as culturally deprived. This, this dropout project was in tune with racial liberalism as opposed to alternative framings of urban problems such as critiques of white supremacy, segregation, and inequality that were being promoted by the civil rights movements and anti-colonial movements. So this, this dropout narrative serves as a tool of crisis management to reaffirm the liberal capitalist order of value these narratives about the dropout, they, they rely on a kind of um, vertical life trajectory tied with an emotional economy. Uh, imagining life as dropout, dropping down, produces shame and fear, while imagining rising up to become a graduate produces pride. So this, this school dropout crisis, school dropout problem narrative exemplifies other elements of the education-based mode of study. This vertical imaginary of possible life trajectories, a terrain of governance for uh, crisis management, an emotional economy of shame, pride, and anxiety, and also these dichotomous figures of waste and value. Um, and in the other chapters, I, I give um, more critical histories of where these different elements of education have come from, how they've emerged. So let's, let's quickly Talk about those. Um, I think I'm running out of time here. Uh, running, running out of time here. So, so I'll, I'll just say the, the, the other chapters are, are about um, how the institution of levels of schools emerged in the um, 13th century um, in a place called Lower Germany. Uh, a, a group of um, converts, religious converts, created these. Uh, levels in their schools as a way to deal with a crisis of disorder that they were experiencing in their schools uh, from having too many students uh, crowding their schools. So, so the levels of schools were a means of um, managing that disorder in their schools. Um, an another element of education that I, I kind of historicize is the um, idea of education itself. So the, the term education emerged in English um, in the 1530s, uh, well, hundreds of years after the first universities. So, so this, this term was used by um, the advisors of King Henry VIII when, when his regime was facing a crisis of legitimacy in the face of, of peasant rebellions. The king's advisors were accused of being illegitimate because they were not of noble birth. They, they found a, a narrative defense by appealing to this new, new idea of education, saying that they had been educated in contrast with their critics. So Eli, can I ask you a question? I know you're um, still going through the, the, and the, the other major aspects of your chapters, but I have a question just yeah. overall, and then I wanted to make sure we give Bill an opportunity to talk about his. So just thinking about big picture, is, is the it's my understanding that the, your particular text is really, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, are you taking a deep dive in higher education and, uh, and attempting to redefine the term education as a means to explain why people snap at this kind of stage? What is the major message that you're trying to tell us here with this particular work? I, I guess the main take home point of the book is, is that um, you think about universities as collections of means for studying, resources for studying sure. together. Sure. Um, 
and, and then we can think, if we think about education as a particular way of studying, a mode of study, as I say, mm -hmm. then, then we can, if we look at the history behind where that mode of study came from and see how it's been bound up with colonialism and capitalism, um, we can think about what, we can ask the question, what, what, what might alternative modes of studying look like and how, how have these been practiced in universities? What, what kinds of movements um, have uh, fought for those modes of studying? Um, so so in, the, the, in the end of the book, I, um, I, I give a, a history Sorry. of, um, of uh, a very spectacular episode in American university history of um, how uh, black students at um, San Francisco State College in the 1960s um, you took control of their campus's um, resources for studying um, through, through a kind of alternative free um, university that, that they organized themselves called the Experimental College. And they, in, in, in that project, they, they engaged in what, what I see as an alternative mode of studying, an alternative to education, because they, 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 weren't, they weren't relying on grades, they had no grades, their classes were all free, they were, they were organizing the classes them, themselves, they didn't have um, professors mediating their relationship with the classes. And they, and, they, and they use those classes as, um, as, as a basis for um, organizing uh, their movement. Um, out of those classes, they um, built desires for more resources, um, which, which stoked their, their, their demand for a, a black studies department, an official black studies department at San Francisco State. Thank you. I think we'll be back for that. And there's, I'm sure there'll be some questions from the audience pertaining to some other ideas of how we can reorder, think about education. But I want to make sure we turn to Bill Ayers. You have a new book coming out, well, that has already come out as well, and becoming, right, a, a teacher. I'm becoming a teacher, I'm becoming but a teacher. I'm not going to talk about the book. This sure. Is a, uh, this is a book about, this is a book for people who are considering becoming teachers, and it's organized as 10 questions and 10 answers. But I think rather than talk about that book, okay. I'm going to speak to your question, okay. which is, what's the takeaway from Eli's book? Sure. Because Eli kindly sent me his book a couple weeks ago, and I found it deeply illuminating. And I'll tell you a couple takeaways that I had from it. Uh, I, the opening vignette that he just mentioned briefly, especially the, the story of Corey Manaphy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's a, this, this man was college educated. He grew up in New Haven went to an historically black college, came home, couldn't get a, a, a steady regular job, got a union job at Yale. Sure. And he got tired of looking at this picture of enslaved workers smiling while they picked cotton in sure. Calhoun College. So he took his broom and smashed it. Yeah. But what's fascinating, and you hit on this a little bit, but I want to underline it. What's fascinating is that Yale finally, I believe, hired him back, yes, right? The, the union right. fought for him, got his job back. But he had to sign a non-disclosure agreement. These things have become very famous recently, right? Yeah, sure. He couldn't talk. Sure. He was silenced. What, and, and the question gets raised, what is Yale afraid of? That billion dollar industry, and here's a black kitchen worker at Calhoun College, and what are they afraid of? What is he gonna teach the students at Yale that the professors in their classrooms are not gonna teach the students at Yale? And that, to me, is a question that resonates Right. throughout the book. Right. Who, who's the teacher? Who's the student? Where do you learn? And where do you learn about the world you're actually living in sure. and participating in? So here we are, in, in Eli's case, housed in universities, looking uneasily at the world we inherit, and where are you going to get your education? It turns out Corey Manaphy is a better teacher for you than the distinguished professor who's organized the history class. I think that's critical to understand what Eli's project sure. is. It also reminds me, I'm teaching a, I'm an adjunct. I'm a, um, I have all the joys of being an adjunct since I retired 10 years ago from the University of Illinois, gleefully exploited by a Catholic university. And um, in my class this term, the first two books we're reading together are Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz's Indigenous uh, People's History of the United States and, and the 1619 Project from Oh my God, the New York Times. I, I, I've been gasping ever since I picked this thing up. How is it possible the New York Times 
publish that, uh, that piece. So that's where we're beginning. But it's an attempt to take what we're given and turn it upside down, not look at it through the lens that we're expected to look at it, but find a new narrative for ex examining history. And as you probably know, the 1619 Project basically says everybody in, in an American school learns about 1776, but it's 1619 right. is when the country begins. Right. And all the contradictions that are unfolding before us come from 1619, not from 1776. Sure. So that, that, is a, that, I think, is one of the takeaways I have from your marvelous book. Another is this notion of snapping. And I think that what's great about that, I kind of, I guess, you know, I kind of loved, I hadn't thought of it that way before, but this idea that you reach a point where you can't take it anymore and you're gasping for air and you go some other direction. It reminded me very much of, and I, and I told Eli this earlier, but it reminded me of a book that, that was also formative for me a couple years ago called The Queer Art of Failure by, by Jack Halberstam. And if you don't know that book, that's worth picking up. One of the things that Jack does that's fabulous is um, he uses uh, Pixar cartoons to make his points. And so I, w I felt right at yes. home being yeah. bathed in, and where, where do you get your education? Pixar, damn it. Um, but but uh, the thesis is simply this, that when things are normal in your relationship, in your career, in your politics, in your world, you just bump along normally. You don't have to look too deeply. You don't have to question too profoundly. And then when things are disrupted, in Eli's case, when you snap, or when things are go awry in any of those realms, then you have to question everything. And the intention of questioning everything, of going to the root, is I think what drives Eli's project. A, a simple example from, from my life and probably from your life, Bernadine, my partner and I, had gotten tickets to Washington, D.C. We were going to go protest once Hillary got elected. We were going to be out in front of the White House with our peace signs. Get it? Normal. Mm -hmm. Hillary would be making war. She'd be the president. We'd be on the margins with our peace signs. All good. There have been, been a few hundred of us, right? We already had it planned. And then, holy shit. You know, um, a, 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 a nuclear <laughs> explosion. And then the Women's March. The Women's March was the snap and the reaction to the snap. And where did you get your education? Not from my peace sign across from Hillary Clinton's White House, but from the Women's March and the spontaneous uprising in opposition to the monstrous thing that we had just witnessed. And it's still unfolding. So to me, that's a snapping kind of thing, or it's the queer art of failure. Then what it leads you to do is question everything, not just a few things. And what's fascinating to me about Eli's work is what we're least likely to question is the taken for granted, because there's nothing more dogmatic and insistent than common sense. Common sense is just the dogma around us. And people like us, we can see the dogma of the House Republicans. We get that. What we can't see so clearly is our own dogma and our own you know, common sense that limits what we can see. And what I think is great about Eli's intervention is he's inviting you to look at where you are, in his case at a university. Look at that and ask questions of that. So I go back to the brilliant moment of Charlie Cobb putting forward a proposal for freedom schools in Mississippi in 1963. And what Charlie Cobb writes, he writes a proposal for freedom schools. It's not a proposal to the MacArthur Foundation or the Department of Education, which is what people do now. It was a proposal to his friends and to his comrades. And it was, you know, on a mimeograph sheet. And if you don't know what a mimeograph sheet is, okay. you can old, Google old, it. Old yeah, yeah, you can Google old it. Um, don't Google it now. But, um, but so it was a mimeograph page. But here's what Cobb said, and this is where we get to Eli's project. Cobb said, the black children of Mississippi have been denied many things, forward-looking curriculum, decent facilities, fully trained teachers, but the fundamental injury is they've been denied the right to think for themselves about the circumstances of their lives and how they might be otherwise. That's a revolutionary statement in Mississippi in 1963, and frankly, it's a revolutionary statement in the Bronx today. It's a revolutionary statement on the west side of Chicago. Think about the circumstances of your life, 
and how they might be otherwise. What we get in the university is a romanticizing and a heroizing of the civil rights movement as if that's your contribution to understanding. What, instead of saying, you know, what are the circumstances of my life here at Cal and how could they be otherwise, we're supposed to look backward to 1965 and say, wasn't it great, all the great things that we did? And that it, no, and I think that's what's so profound about saying, we have to challenge the narrative, we have to look deeply, and then we have to ask serious, sustained questions about the universe we live in. Last point that he makes very well, and Ruth Gilmore, if you're going to stay, and I hope you do, um, has made again and again, and that is that he, he calls for an abolition university. But abolition not in the sense of simply tearing down something that exists, because even in the 1850s and 60s, abolition meant many, many different things. The question is, a radical democracy abolition says, what do we want to build? I'm reminded of my colleague and friend Eric Rofus, who wrote a book called Status Quo or Status Queer. And the question that that book raises again and again is, do I want to break the glass ceiling and be the first queer teacher to do X or Y or Z? Or do I want to build a world where my queerness doesn't question my humanity? And I think that's the kind of thing that Eli brings into focus, and I think in a very powerful way. So I salute you and the book and uh, the project, and I hope everyone can join in that at some point. Absolutely. I know you have some plans for activities, right? So before we get to the, before we get to the activities, I just want to say that Thank you both for those comments, because I think as, as people in the audience would also agree that there are a lot of people, women, marginalized people, and such, minoritized people and such, that have felt this same kind of moment of snapping and looking at the critical perspective in which we're in, and it takes a moment for all of us to say, hey, let's do something about it. So I commend you for, for getting that conversation going in yet another arena. So you want to bring us to your activities? What do you have in mind? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I thought that we could break out of this kind of top-down, talking at you situation and practice a more horizontalist, participatory mode of studying here by, by having y'all talk in, in small groups about some, some questions in response to some questions that pick up on the themes of what we've been talking about here. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you these questions and then you can get into, I invite you to get into small groups of two or three or four uh, or five. Um, and we can, you can talk about these, these questions um, for about five, 10 minutes, and then, then we'll regroup and, and your groups can each share with, with everybody else what you talked about. So the, the, the questions are, um, well, the first one is, what, what practices of alternative modes of study have you engaged in in your life? Um, or or, or what, what alternative modes of study have you desired to engage in if you haven't? actually, but I, I think you have actually engaged in alternative modes of study in some way. Um, the second question is, how, how have these alternative studying practices been interrelated with other practices in your life, um, other practices like organizing or gardening or caring for your loved ones or caring for your pets, um, all, all kinds of other everyday life practices? How, how has studying been interrelated with your, the rest of your life. Um, third question, how, how have these study practices been related with projects or, or visions for um, abolishing or dismantling this uh, capitalist dominant world? Um, and, and how have they been bound up with visions or projects for building an alternative world, making a world alternative to capitalism? racism, settler colonialism, patriarchy. Um, and final, final question, um, what, what kinds of limits and challenges have you experienced in practicing these kinds of alternative modes of study and alternative ways of making the world? And, and what, what kinds of um, strategies or tactics, relationships, counter institutions, could we create to overcome those limits to grapple with those challenges? Question. Yeah, yeah, al alternative to um, schooling. Um, so c these, these practices could take place within schools, within universities, or outside of them. 
um, or across their boundaries. Um, so pr practices alternative to, to the kind of um, normal education uh, that, that you think of Are in schooling. Or, like or classroom class-based kind of instruction outside, we're thinking outside of that? Um, it, could, it, it could be studying that, ha that happens within a class, within sure. a classroom, or, or outside of a class, outside of schools, um, out in the world beyond, beyond the spaces of schools and universities. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's um, let, let's get into small groups, and you can share share with each other your ideas, and that, then we'll regroup after five ten minutes. Okay. So yeah, gr get together with a few people near you and uh, discuss these questions. Feel free to opt out if you don't want to talk in a group. <laughs> we gave him what was that? Six questions. Four questions. Well, you got six? One, yeah, I had five, actually. Got Alternative four. modes, then how are they interrelated? Are they related to any projects of dis dismantling? It's all and then question. limit. It is. You know, it's all but you know question. how classrooms are. Are we going to talk about it? We gonna, we sure, we'll be a small group. Thank you for stopping me from coming to No, the it's okay. I want to make sure this. that everyone that has a good. fair, yeah. you know. Um, you know, what I keep thinking about, <laughs> both that I've participated and watched, I mean, I think of the Children's Crusade in Birmingham in 1962. Okay. I think of the Serena walkout. Sure. Those kids learned more in, the, in that short time yeah. than they ever learned in a classroom. Sure. I, think the, I think of the climate strike yesterday. Sure. I mean, what sure. The, that's where, sure. yeah, and you look, if you saw, I was in Chicago, so I was in some of those things. You see these young people, or think of the people's assemblies in Puerto Rico right mm -hmm, now, mm -hmm, dealing mm -hmm. with the hurricane, sure. or think of Hong, well, Hong Kong. Kong. Yeah, exactly. Sure, yeah. right, that's why I'm that, like, To me, yeah. all of that is great, and we have here, well, the United Nurses just went on strike yesterday. Sure. Did you know that? Right. At the University of Chicago, they called the one-day strike, and the University of Chicago locked them out for five right, days. Right, 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 right. Son of a bitch. This is you where, know? this is so, where we're So they just want to have a one-day action, and the University of Chicago locked them out. being on a picket line or being in a demonstration or being on the women's march. That was a better education than, than being a college class with like women's studies. Yeah. I think, let's see, I think mine has been just the, the, the act of learning how to become a professor has been mine. Mm -hmm. right? I'm the first of everything, so there was no one else in my family who has a doctorate or a right. anything. Right? Everybody thinks it's just being a teacher. Politics in higher ed, if you don't know, it was, an, it was an education in and of itself. Just trying to figure out what do you mean by tenure and motion and why are they different and that type of thing, right? Not the paper, but the actual pr policy procedures, the culture of being a pr professor at higher ed level. It's just totally different than my high school so social studies classroom, right? You know, you make me think of, and, and, you know, I, I used to say to my, I, I didn't follow through, but Eli has, but I used to say to my, Research class, mm. uh, it, it, you know, if you want to do a qualitative study of something that's going to be fascinating, do a qualitative study of how you get tenure. Because there are rules oh, over yeah. here. Oh, yeah. But the rules, but are, the rules are, yeah, pretty I mean, much. What's, that's what's what I was really going find out what's really correct. Over here. correct. And so doing correct. a qualitative correct. study where you look at the actual correct. meaning correct. of tenure correct. for those who hold the, the, the keys correct. would be a fascinating correct. thing. But nobody does the self study. You know, that's, that's the reason why it's But you didn't have one in fact. No. See, I'm, I had one in 
right? Black Lives Matter, issue. Something happening in politics, issue. Women, issue, right? And, and it's everyone participating in this discourse in such a way that they're not these pockets of the other, because that's what it seems like it is to me. Does that make sense? Am I making sense? You are. Okay. And what you're making me think also is, you know, you are an example of this um, Tory being silenced by sure. Yale. I find that just more fascinating. I can tell you, you know, what, what is he afraid of that Tory opens his mouth, right? But then I think about Black Lives Matter in Chicago, which is as vibrant and exciting and interconnected and cross-issue as it could possibly be. And the man is trying to make a narrative about it. Of course, it everything is really let's silence simple, him. Let's keep going on. Right? Let's just let you hit you put you put a nail right on the head when you let's silence him, keep going. Right? Exactly. Let's move let's on. Let's move on. It's moving that's over. On. Let's move on. And you can't even be one minute into the story no, when you no, want to move on. No, let's move on. Occupy. I don't know if right. you saw Stephen Colbert during the Occupy mm. movement in the beginning. He brought in two of his so called leaders from it and tried to bribe them to not no, to give it up and it was problem. hilarious. Right, that's what it I'm was like. funny because it was what was really going on. Bill Clinton advising the occupied people right. on how to dress. What the fuck is it? Cor correct. You know, well, crazy. We gotta bring back because you have fifteen minutes. I know you wanna hear from your people. And it's over at seven fifty or so because then give them a couple more minutes. I'm sorry. Because you wanna at least give opportunity for people to share out and we have one more after us once we go over. Oh they you just stop at seven fifty. Let's stop at like seven fifty, seven fifty five for a bathroom break and then do they set up for the next one? And there we go. I know, I hate to stop this for but at the same time. You know, it's the way it is. It is the way it is. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen. If we can finish our thoughts. I feel like I'm in the classroom. Hi. Like I feel like I'm in my classroom. Do you know who's filming? I, I know, but we haven't officially met. Hello. Oh, I'm like, there's so many of us, but that's, I'm so honored and humbled. You have no idea. I'm sitting next to you. Can you? Well, we'll do it afterward. You'll sign my book for me, right? You'll sign my book. Okay. All right. <laughs> if we can bring it back, we'd like to give opportunity for share out. I like the way Mark's listening. That's a classroom management technique. Good work. <laughs> Good classroom management. All right. I like the way Mark is listening. <laughs> All right, so, so <clears throat> would any of your groups uh, like to share anything particularly in interesting, provocative that you talked about? Any, uh, any point of disagreement that you'd like to share? Any, any radical vision that you'd like to share? Yes. Oh, uh, please wait for the mic, thanks. First off, um, we've all had teachers we've loved but I'm sure we've all, as little kids, experienced the misery of learning stuff we had no interest in, sure. with people who had no interest in teaching, and even, you know, I mean, I grew up at a time where it was duck and cover, and, you know, yeah. even as like a nine-year-old, you realize these people are insane. There's no point in ducking and covering if there's a nuclear war. So, so you have to Google <laughs> duck and cover. They don't know what you're talking about. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, because I'm older. So it's duck and cover, right? Um, you know, this was around Cuban Missile Crisis, but it was before that as well. And, you know, you would be told to go under your desk if there was a nuclear bomb. And any sure. normal sure, eight or right, nine-year-old yeah. would right. realize the people saying this to you are insane. <laughs> and it eventually led me to... Go back to school years later and wow. become a mental health worker. And do you remember <laughs> that after you ducked and covered, after the uh, bomb was over, you were supposed to wash thoroughly? Wow. Yes. Wow. And be careful for the glass yeah. Wow. Okay. Any other thoughts, ideas, thinking about radical education, alternative modes? Any, any limits? Sure. So, yeah, so... Um, in, in the group, we, we uh, was, was, excuse me, we, we was talking about um, organizational um, learning and, and things of that nature. And I, I know that at, at Picture the Homeless, we studied um, something that's called community land trust. And so sometimes it's easy to talk at people when it comes to explaining property and land and the value of it. But we came up with a board game. It was a collective of folks in the room studying land. So we had to come up with a whole entire different language and everything. So what we did was we created a board game. 
And the board game gave people on hand experience of what a community land trust could look like in their community. And so we, we learned that people learn fast. But when you actually play in a board game in a game and you have hands on decisions on what goes in your community with a board game, it makes the learning a little bit more clearer. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Sure. Interactive piece is important. Uh, groups in the back over here. Alternative modes of education, challenges, ideas. Sure. Well, I asked the question about uh, alternative to what because to, to me, it seems like everything is a mode of study. Um, and so the school model that we know of is the alternative. That's the thing that's like a particular way of doing things that seems very unnatural. Sure. And like when I'm playing a board game sure. or when I'm here talking, you know, or when I'm reading a book okay. or when I'm writing or playing music or cooking or whatever, I am also studying yeah. that practice. Sure. You know, in the practice, I'm always Gardening. studying, yeah. right? Yeah, and, right? And like, I like these, I like certain sorts of totalizing descriptions that are contingent, so that they're not mutually excuse, exclusive. So I think of us always as we're all teachers, and we're all students, you know, and we're all artists, you know, and we're all healers, and we all need to be healed, and these sorts of things that we can apply these lenses. And so if we look at everyone being a teacher all the time and also a student all the time, right. and then everything's a class all the time, sure. you know, then, then that school model really is the alternative that's like, why is it this way? Mm -hmm. you know, and everything else opens up all these ways of being uh, a mode of study. Sure. You touch on that in your, in your text. Yeah, and, and I, I think that's right. I think that that's a very important idea, but you know, the other thing that I was provoked to think about was the ways in which, and I've, we've known this, I mean, Eli and, and Mark relate this to kind of organizing, for example, organizing, or a picket line. Is that a place of study? Or yesterday's climate strike, a perfect example of a mass study going on all over the world. Or the Puerto Rican People's Assemblies, which are happening spontaneously right now, in response to the great movement that drove out the governor, but now what? And the People's Assemblies are sites of study, sites of, of conversation. Uh, Black Lives Matter in Chicago. Um, the Who Owns Appalachia, the Highlander study, Who Owns Appalachia, which took years to figure out all the blind trusts and who actually owned the land that people were working and toiling on. So I don't know, I think there's so many and I, and I think in the 1963 Children's Crusade in Birmingham, those kids walked out of school, and that's where they did their best learning, right? Sure. So many, many examples. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nympha. I'm from the Mayan Work, uh, Migrant Workers Association. Uh, we, ca we help women who were trafficked all over the world, by, mostly by diplomats. And we stand against them because they have immunity and you cannot, you know, fight them in the court. But we in the organization, uh, we rallied in front of the consulates here in New York. And most of, the, most of the fights we had were won. And the traffic women were reunited with their families from the Philippines. And education, uh, these women were lured by placement agencies, even if they graduated. They were lured to have a better life here. They were promised better salaries, but most of them were given only half of the $1,000, 500 per month, working 18 to 22 hours a day, and were not given a decent place to sleep, only in basements. And one from Saudi Arabia, uh, she was in the basement, lying down on, um, on the floor, and only given to, uh, two meals a day. And she would roll up cigarette for the Arab guy, and she would call. He would call him anytime, even 2 a.m. And now she is happy with her family here in New York. Thank God, we stand up and fight back. We were empowered as women. Thank you. <laughs> 
importance of alternative forms of studying? Well, no pressure. I do have one last question for the, do we have one? Ken? Sure. I'm really interested in the freedom schools and I've uh, like studied them and uh, I think it's, I mean one of the things that they learned at the end, they developed a basic curriculum and at the end of it they basically like, threw it out and they were like, we didn't really even need the curriculum, that it was better just to start with the experience of the people in this thing. Uh, but it hasn't, I mean there are various forms of it that have emerged over the years or whatever, but why, is it, are there places where this is still being practiced and why is it, I mean, even there was, you know, last year they sort of brought back the Freedom Summer or whatever and they didn't bring back the Freedom Schools as far as I know. I mean, one of the dangers, one of the dangers um, is exactly um, valorizing the past instead of using the technique that was so revolutionary in that moment and applying it today to say, wasn't it great that we had freedom schools is different than saying, what are the circumstances of your lives today and how could they be otherwise? But yes, that pedagogy, which is a pedagogy of questioning, goes on to this day in lots and lots of places. And I think, Eli, in your book, you, um, you document several places where people are using a pedagogy. They did develop a curriculum, but the fundamental thing to know about the curriculum is it wasn't like any curriculum you think of. Here are the goals, here's what you learn. It was a curriculum of questioning. And the questions began, why are you and I in the freedom movement? That's a great, profound question. It's not a right or wrong question. You don't give it an A or a B when somebody answers it. Why are you and I in the freedom movement? What do we hope to accomplish? What does the majority culture have that we want? What do we have that we want to maintain? What would the world look like if we could organize it for our needs. Those are questions that drive things forward, but I think there are many examples of it, and you, you document several in the book. Oh, quickly, one, one recent example, the kind of freedom school is um, a, a university that's embedded with the protests in Hawaii, uh, uh, the protests against um, building this uh, telescope. Um, it's an indigenous Hawaiian name. Um, I don't know how to pronounce it. Is it. They may not have pronounced the name of that. that no, I, I can read it, but I can't um, say it. Yeah. But it, yeah, it's uh, Im embedded with their organizing, and they're they're teaching each other and learning from each other about um, indigenous Hawaiian people's history and languages, um, and learning uh, about techniques of resistance in that school. So that, that that's one. Example. And that actually was a case where a professor from the University of Hawaii came over and joined the struggle and offered, I think, a class. And by two weeks in, there were 400 classes or something, and everybody joined in. Standing Rock similarly developed schools that, that really reclaimed and rethought how to think about the struggle from the point of view of a curriculum of questioning, not a body of knowledge to transmit to passive students, but, a, but a, an approach that said we can interrogate the universe. We need no one's permission to interrogate the universe. That's what makes it radical. Sure. All right. I guess it's a good time for us to wrap that up. I want to say thank you to both of our thank esteemed you, authors, you. Bill Ayers, Eli Meyerhoff. It's been great. Thank you very much for giving us your insight. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you. We'll turn it over to Mark. Mark. Hi, everybody. Uh, we're going to take about a quick two-minute break, so if you need to use the restrooms, they are right here. Uh, Word Up Books has books from both Bill and Eli at the table back there, and we'll gather back here in about three or four minutes for the final session of the evening. Please stick around. Thank you. Good job.
Hello. Hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, if we could gather back in our seats for our final event of the evening. So uh, I'm not going to say too much here. Uh, if you came in late, I'm Mark Nowak. I'm the director of the Worker Writers School. Uh, we are in our ninth year in collaboration with Penn America, working with different worker centers all around the city uh, for monthly free creative writing workshops, Domestic Workers United, Taxi Workers Alliance, Picture the Homeless, the Mayan Migrant Workers Association, Retail Action Project, and others. Uh, we do these events twice a year. Uh, and then do lots of other things as well. So if you want to, follow us on Twitter at Worker Writers. Uh, final, uh, you know, we've been playing around the last few years with taking language and the vocabulary of school and trying to break it apart for titles of things we did. So we did a, a fall assembly and it was more like a workers assembly. We used to do a fall uh, summer school on Governor's Island where we no played with the notion of summer school. And this one, of course, was to break down the term study hall into radical study, the panel we just heard with Bill Ayers and Eli. Uh, and Nikki, thanks Nikki. And uh, this one is uh, on Stuart Hall. So the, how this came about, super briefly, is that uh, I uh, emailed a friend I know uh, who works at Duke University Press and said I was doing this because Duke has this really great new series on Stuart Hall out. And he said, well, I know someone who's working on a book on Stuart Hall, and hence this came about. Uh, but I'm going to let uh, Nicole Fleetwood do the introduction, professor from Rutgers University uh, who has a couple amazing books of her own out. And if you haven't seen the recent issue of Aperture magazine from last year that she co-edited, uh, uh, super fantastic issue, so please check that out as well. Without further ado, Nicole. Thank, thank you so much, Mark, and good evening. This is um, a really great gathering. I enjoyed the panel. Um, that is, I, I enjoy participating in that panel and getting to know people and thinking about study and curiosity. Um, and I am so delighted to have the privilege to introduce Dr. Ruthie Wilson Gilmore. And I met Ruthie in er the early 2000s. I had just gotten my PhD, and I was at the American Studies Association Conference, and I was quite nervous and unsure of how to, about how to navigate the profession. And I was standing in the hallway, and Ruthie came up to me and said, Nicole Fleetwood, I love your work. <laughs> and I had like two articles out at the time, <laughs> at most. Um, but I don't know if she remembers that moment, but it was so important for me because it really did, it was like this kind of w the warm welcome and type of recognition just gave me this assurance that, you know, I belonged um, and that, you know, and that I could be a part of a community um, of academics. And I've, t I've spoken with countless others who say very similar things about Ruthie, that she's welcomed them, she's advised them, she's guided them, she's cautioned them. <laughs> and most importantly, she's modeled ways of how to walk one's talk, how to be an incredible scholar, activist, mentor, public intellectual, um, and someone who has transformed so many fields and discussions. Um, as many of you know, she's a professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences and the director of the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics at the City University of New York Graduate Center. And she's also the co-founder of many grassroots organizations, including the California Prison Mor Moratorium Project and Critical Resistance. She works on racial capitalism, organized violence, organized abandonment, changing state structure, criminalization, and labor and social movements. Current projects include a second edition of the prize-winning Golden Gulag, Prison Surplus Crisis and Opposition in Globalizing California. And other recent projects include um, an incredible essay, Abolition Geography and the Problem of Innocence and the Futures of Ra uh, Black Radicalism that was edited by Alex Lubin and Johnson. Who? Kate okay. Johnson. Yeah, thank you. Um, as well as the for, for a new collection of essays by Cedric Robinson and a major collection of Stuart Hall's writings on race and difference that she's editing with Paul Gilroy. She has lectured in Africa, Asia, Europe, and North America, and her honors include the American Studies Association Angela Y. Davis Award for Public Scholarship in 2012, the Association of American Geographies Harold Rose Award for Anti-Racist Research and Practice, 
the SUNY Purchase College Eugene D. Grant Distinguished Scholar Prize for Social and Environmental Justice, and the American Studies Association's Richard A. Yar Yarborough Mentorship Award. Um, in April of this year, novelist Rachel Kushner profiled her in a New York Times Magazine feature article. So um, Ruthie is going to lecture for as much time as she needs, and then I'll come up and moderate a, a, a discussion. Okay. So please join me in welcoming the esteemed Ruthie Wilson. Thank you, thank you, Nicole, and I do remember that moment. I, re I remember it very well, coming around the corner, seeing her sitting in one of those, you know, kind of whitish corridors in some hotel somewhere, and, you know, there were kind of somewhat plush bunkettes on the side, and I thought, double take, triple take, that's Nicole Fleetwood. Let me go say hello, and I'm so glad I did. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to talk for the next little while actually about learning to be a better reader, um, which is part of the practice of study. It is not required of everyone. There are plenty of people who don't read who are the smartest and the most insightful, the best analysts, and the best at doing all kinds of things. But for those of us who do, do read, this is about reading and it's about writing. So I, I start with an epigram from Hazel Carby. She wrote uh, in 1987, for his rigorous intellect, political acumen, and theoretical insights, and for being the best teacher I ever had, I am indebted to Stuart Hall. In the late 1980s, Hazel Carby's Reconstructing Womanhood introduced a Southern California reading group to the Birmingham Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies. We never doubted the continuity and interplay among campaigns for justice, community-generated inquiry, and informal and organized education, including university training. At the time, I was a dropout. But craving fresh insights, we read newer texts in areas such as black feminist theory to challenge what we thought we already knew. So this is the late 1980s. Keen interest in pedagogy, sparked by encounters with Paulo Freire and others, and admiration for Carby's militant learning, shown in her book, made us curious about the center. At that time, it wasn't easy to find Stuart Hall's publications in the USA, which is hard to believe, but it wasn't easy. One of our cadre, a bookseller, came up with a few titles. The first was Race, Articulation, and Society Structured in Dominance. So go figure, that was the first thing we put our minds to. We didn't know what the title meant, but we decided we had to read it. Then we read The Hard Road to Renewal, and soon thereafter, Hall's Lectures in Marxism and the Interpretation of Culture. So that's where we began. At the outset, we had a hard time saying what excited us so much. Hall's writing combines patient grounding with radiant analysis, and it recapitulates objectively and subjectively his project's layered setting. That is, attentive to the conditions of production and use of its elements, each intervention's topics, methods, evidence, and explanatory procedures add up to an achievement that is stubbornly concrete, yet exceeds its immediate design. The actions that cohere in and as writing suggest to readers how to do something else. The qualities that captured our imaginations thickened our tongues with awe. We just couldn't talk about it. Much later, we realized that our heady insight turned out to be a, if not the, central lesson of reading Stuart Hall. Stuart Hall's work models social theory as action. It is a guide for thinking about, analyzing, understanding, and organizing to change distinct but densely interconnected geographies of what he described as, quote, the global maldistribution of material and symbolic resources, close quote. Therefore, Against any flat insistence that specificity arises from fractures and partitions that, demand, that are demanded by justice, the particular tendencies in the pages of the book that Paul and I have 
edited together, underlie the ongoing urgency of expansive politics, including what, perhaps for want of a better word, we persist in calling internationalism. Although full of questions, we hadn't been idle back then in the 80s. While Mandela was still in prison, militant intellectuals gathered from the North and South, including delegates from COSATU, the ANC, and the Communist Party of South Africa, to debate the trajectories and challenges of anti-capitalist and anti-racist anti solidarity under the rubric Pan-Africanism Revisited, liberation movements in Africa and the diaspora. Meanwhile, others researched and drafted text for a writers and readers documentary comic about Anglophone North American and Caribbean black writing, mostly fiction. That project, called 400 Years of Attitude, Black Literature for Beginners, that's a joke, <laughs> Uh, explored the structures of feeling through and against which writers and writers crafted stories about becoming and remaining free. As an excursion into concrete determinants and multiple de definitions of possibility for freedom, 400 Years also looked at how readers came to the texts, covers, publishers, literacy, subscriptions, appeals, ink, paper, distribution. We struggled with the LA-8, seven Palestinians and one Kenyan who were accused under the McCarran-Walter Act, which was written to I identify and deport communists from the post-war USA, and they were members of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the only people ever to have been prosecuted under that act. And no matter what, we fought tirelessly in local and broader campaigns while always trying to learn more. Internationalism and a good deal of anti-capitalist decolonial regionalism weakened as the Soviet Union lurched to its end. Structural adjustment undermined self-determination and mutual assistance for newly independent as well as newly industrializing states. In short, politics was a mess, and we were busy trying to organize, promote ideas, and bargain in every possible arena. We could not agitate around race, and difference without agitating against capitalism and its institutional infrastructures, the sorting and stacking machines, including schools, that all kinds of organizers sought to slow down and rework or dismantle and use as scrap for new things. We feared patience might be the enemy of resistance, and at the same time we learned from Barbara Harlow that resistance could become part of the repertoire that we were trying to interrupt. In our daily efforts to incite people to campaign read readiness, our default had become stuck on repeating terrible details about any given site of struggle and enumerating the details horrifying antecedents. These eloquent harangues presented as analyses of causes actually focused on the effects of social, ideological, economic, cultural, and environmental upheaval. Further, our practice ignored an organizing principle at the heart of CLR James's reminder that revolutions happen because people wait and wait and try every little thing. Having broken James's teaching into two pieces, we got stuck on wait and figured that slinging fatal facts and inflammatory slogans would make people feel our impatience and end anybody's satisfaction with little things. The approach in retrospect was panic-driven disregard for distinctions between facts and values and inattention to the constant interplay among categories, experience, common sense, and consciousness. As a result, we were busy, but what we'd broken obscured two key words, try every. Reading Stuart Hall enlarged our capacity to notice and follow strands of already existing activity and practice to see what is going on when it might seem like nothing's going on, what try every meant with that valorizing all efforts. That is, we looked with greater care at Hall's analytical actions and then extended that attentiveness to the actions of the people we worked with, including within our own cadre or against, the materials available, the discourses employed, and the historical geographies in which the struggles emerged, developed, and resolved, displaced, or dissipated. With care, but not prejudice, we, we traced out contradictions to focus on dynamics and processes in relation to those strands. 
Contradiction, as everybody in this room knows, shapes struggles. It makes them specific within interdependent, politically unequal relationships. A contour can seem to be a natural or socially absolute barrier, an edge so dramatic that the remedy for a problem appears to find before a fight even begins. Fresh questions can open consciousness by suggesting unexpected fragilities or openings that might be politically near to hand. The point of action is to stretch the familiar in delightful and disturbing ways and therefore unsettle subjectivity if only for a moment. At the same time, experiments with theoretical and categorical tools refocus objectivity by revealing context-specific elements of categories that seem self-evident, such as crime, race, nation, hunger. This is what we learned reading Stuart Hall, and it took 30 years for me to be able to write that. If Hall's vivid compositions as social theory serve as guides to action, they also model methodologies. What is methodology? Methodology is a sequence of actions that produce evidence, shape evidence into arguments, and arrange arguments into answers to the question we ask. So there's sequences of actions, sequences of actions, sequences of actions. In the social world, actions frequently belie themselves because to wait and try is useful, meaningful, even purposeful, without being necessarily instrumental, measurable, or defined. Organizers and researchers also wait and try. Following from Hall, our group became productively aware of the opportunity to notice inconsistencies between experience and consciousness, scale and struggle. This awareness compelled us to rework questions and renew sequences of actions. Lifting a veil from theory and method freed us of a debilitating burden, which was our tendency, in spite of ourselves, to conform to a sound and style of political engagement, bombarded by poisons and sweets, mostly resolved as rage. That was not our first takeaway from the pages. When it came to political writing and social theory, many of us had become bad readers. On the one hand, as our pursuit of Carby and Hall suggests, we avidly searched for guidance in a constellation of thinkers and writers who could show us how to make sense of late modernity's cumulative catastrophes and onrushing displacements, which are greater and greater now than they were 30 years ago. But in doing so, we tended to extract from the texts that we read names, facts, or trends that could command our loyalty and, we imagine, the undivided attention of others. The quest to become members of something, however much it's drenched in sorry sectarian histories, highlights the felt need to organize imaginative and associative energies into appealing and sturdy and extendable social forms. It's why we form groups, and it's a good thing. If the patterns we learned to rely on had become inadequate to requirements, then how should we fight? Political, uh, political intellectual collectivities were bubbling and crackling with controversies over culture and theory, belonging and partition. It was time to step down from the heights and look more closely at what was to hand. There was a lot. We could read it if we would read it. The power of literacy to make us fit for struggle should be exercised like a muscle, not waved around like a membership card. We had stopped noticing thought in its context and therefore failed to understand the action that inheres in non-fictional narrative. This sliver of awareness, there's some action in the stuff we were reading, disturbed us enough to keep at it. Since we were organizers, and few of us had steady day jobs that paid us to think and write, we were neither timid nor rigid. Avid readers of imaginative literature, we thought and fought about emplotment, the geographic ordering of space and the narrative ordering of time that entwines like a double helix or twists from multiple dimensions into a continuous single surface like a Mebius strip. Art compelled our contemplative energies both to dwell in a work and to be inhabited by its, its interiority, its atmosphere, its action. When it came to genre, we were absolutely sluts. <laughs> You're listening. By contrast, <laughs> we read political prose as though it were a cudgel 
What stood out then were the sharp edges or flaws as those, the selection of themes, of findings, of assembly, of theorists determined whether the blunt instrument would either inflict pain or shatter. That's all we wanted it to do. As much as we generally aspired to fluency in admired authors, we didn't dwell in their implotments to understand how story and discourse revised our ability to wield subtler weapons. As I said, we read for allegiance, which seemed to demand either making or withholding a pledge. Another way to put it is we read in order to recite, writing down and tightening our throats around data and phrases that stoked or deflected our rage. We didn't find ourselves any better at everyday tasks, much less able to rework what we were doing. And plus, we sounded like cops with mid 1960s sociology degrees. <laughs> The image wasn't altogether off, since reading to recite made us seem to be barking terms of deferential loyalty or shadowy threat. We expected the words magically to do work. Magical words. We blasted meetings, meetings with declarations of this or that, and were rather amazed that even when people listened to the opaque or poetic detailed facts and curly cues, nobody, including us, stopped in their tracks and changed course. One magical word we had to work through was specificity and figure out how it meant to anchor an analysis close to the actual set of relations, events, crises, and demonstrate how a theoretical guide through concrete puzzles models approaches to dynamics in motion altogether. What does an example do to strengthen our ability to grasp what's immediately before us in the lecture or the text and use the generative excitement of muscle and brain to think about how we see and show terror, vulnerability, endurance, and beauty in general, even though it's changing while we organize and write. What work do we think we've done, did we think we'd done and could do with the work before us? We knew better than to confuse vocabulary words with insight, yet we always hoped some word might sing, signal new clarity that we could then share around. Busy, to beguile by reciting, we didn't fight the angels of theory that roamed and swarmed everywhere. And this is one of Stewart's essays, is about fighting off theory rather than succumbing to it. Warily, we switched gears and tried to read as engineers, to understand the interworkings of system and structure, premise, form, tone, example, style, and the contextual questions where did each work arise? Why? What's different now as we read in time and place? We dismantled the blunt instrument to see not only what it was made of, but also how it was made, the nesting of placemaking energies concentrated in print. Engineers, doing and doing again. Not practice makes perfect, but rather repetition differentiates. One stops um, and stops being repetition. At some point, if it's not recital, it's rehearsal. Listing the processes in the text as we came to understand them pushed us to a fresh appreciation of the sort of thing we had in front of us, the entirety of history as the Aymara teach us in front of us. At the end of each reading episode, we realized we had to try things on to try them out. This insight had everything to do with the group dynamic that often degenerated into oscillating between speaking and waiting instead of speaking and listening. Hall said we ought to work on what bites into our existence. He might have meant what's scary or perhaps what hurt us so much that it made us angry, the things whose penetrating venom enraged our moods. It dawned on us to stop reciting and start rehearsing. The conviviality that we encountered in his writing extended to how we found our way in, welcomed. Stuart Hall explains how he's found his way to and through each puzzle explored in a lecture or essay, broadcast or interview. His curiosity models patiently connecting and expressing, which is to say, using his word, articulating, specific ways that the historical geographies of the present emerge co-constituting in human environmental interactions, experience, thought, and consciousness. There are, as he reminds us, no guarantees. The work persistently inclines towards syncretic rather than purified, 
the interdisciplinary imperative shapes everything that Hall did. That's a hard thing to do, especially in the contemporary context of relentless claims that difference distinguishes so thoroughly that the only way to describe unity in struggle is through military analogy, the ally. And it makes perfect sense because the war is real. If it is real, then, if it is real though, then we should plan to win. But what would win, winning look like for people absorbed by rage as the shield against despair? Rage, like stage fright, lays waste unless it's used. We decided to read Stuart Hall's texts as though we were actors. We had experience in agitprop, avant-garde theater, dance, performance art, and all of us were organizers, and a lot of us spent a lot of time with Brecht. We embraced double consciousness as a gift, not a curse, feeling that to be alien unto ourselves is a kind of fluency, not binary, but never singular. By thinking about how politics is becoming, society is becoming in the flesh, we rehearsed. Rehearsal is persistence in every little thing, while also the opposite of static. It is the material, symbolic substance for change, criticism of habits, inconsistencies, nightly notes, written but not scripted. Interpretive practice gave us courage to improvise and enabled us to be vulnerable in our skin to a wide variety of discourses and registers, materialities and directions. This is not a metaphor, because to act requires detailed observation, which we might call hearing, although it need not be through the ears. Plot and place turn out not to be unities, which means action is not either. If the text thinkers, in, in Hall's text, excuse me, thinkers gather to th talk over specific problems, not to prove points already confirmed. It's fantastic how in Hall's writing, the topic that prompts his inquiry inspires us to notice aspects of it we otherwise might ignore because we're thinking categories together differently stretching even in the analytical project geometrically discontinuous, um, stretching even in the intellect, uh, analytical project. So some people say, for example, that Hall incorporates Foucault. He invites him in to talk stuff over. There isn't any incorporation happening. It's like, it's, it's a little different. That is, actually existing activity is both the object of analysis, this article or lecture is about the activity X, and also the uh, occasion to assemble activity, to coordinate thinkers whose topics might differ, but whose commitments also have developed in the dynamic context of capitalism, saving capitalism from capitalism, i.e. the thinkers aren't random, even though the range is really quite breathtaking. The through line, perhaps unsurprising in a recovering student of Henry James, which is what Hall went to uh, graduate school to do his PhD in, explores consciousness as firm and tentative habits of becoming rather than aggregated effects of experience. The writers Hall talks with aren't random, as I said, while their analytical approach is some, sometimes distracting, though steadied by resolute anti-sectarianism. Their presence gently destroys any implication that specificity might be a tidally self-contained unity of time, place, and action. Instead, the object of analysis is prized open by practitioners whose own development and movement through the grand oppositional epic of capitalist modernity, of racial capitalism altogether, demonstrates how specificity perpetually opens rather than partitions thought about the world by making the familiar strange, which is to say, productively alien. So what I thought I would do with a few more minutes, and then Nicole will come back up and we'll talk with everyone, is give a brief example more detailed example from one of Hall's essays that we'll be publishing in this book. Um, and it's called, it's one that few of you have read, I think. I think it was never published. It's called Africa is Alive and Well in the Diaspora. And it's, a, it's an essay that um, Hall wrote in um, uh, 
in the 1970s at a, a convening of people uh, that was organized by UNESCO to talk about the future of um, uh, the Global South in general, but particularly the future of the decolonizing and de-apartheiding, slowly, 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 states of Africa. And he was uh, asked to, to, to produce this essay uh, at a convening, and the slot that he filled had previously been filled by none other than Amilcar Cabral. So he was feeling a little overwhelmed by the task that uh, was set to him. So what he did was quite an astonishing thing that um, is, in a way, an illustration of all of the things that I've been sharing with you this evening. He decided to uh, study and study a case in which people who identify as African, who are not on that continent, came to elaborate, which is to say rehearse that identification through the development of an entire system of symbolic as well as material resources, a consciousness that is small z, not big z Zionist, right? That is looking to return someday home. Who am I talking about? Rastafari. So his analysis is of how, among other th things, the, the people who um, developed Rastafarianism, which is a 20th century Western Hemisphere religion, you know that, there are many, Mormonism, Rastafari, and so forth, um, how they used what Hall calls an alien text, that is to say the Bible, right? to give themselves an indication for how they could rehearse their own freedom. Right? So they didn't take a lockstep approach to that text. They found in that text indications of a world that they could imagine inhabiting, a future world, right? a future heaven, as some of South African liberationists would say, that um, was elaborated through song, through preaching, through everyday practices, through hair, you know, one small symbol of Rastafari. And it had an eye on return for people who had never been there. So going back to a place you've never been. So consider the triangulation then. The Bible, Old and New Testament, people in particularly, but not exclusively, Jamaica and the Caribbean, which is more or less part of North America, um, looking to some place, let us call it, generally speaking, Ethiopia, to think about making home. This is what he wrote. But having written that, he also wrote how it is that the Rastafari emerged in the context of contentious Jamaican politics in the period um, uh, during and then post-independence to uh, help, uh, whether or not it was their intention, frame the kinds of political um, and economic policies that the various parties contending for power, electoral and otherwise, um, uh, sought. Right? So as I said at the very beginning of my remarks, uh, each of Hall's pieces, uh, as, it was, as it were, states again in the piece all of the conditions concerning what he's talking about, the object of analysis, but also give us a sense of the conditions under which it is possible to think about that subject at all to think about that subject at all. So I want to uh, sort of wind up here to ask a, a question of us. And that is, uh, one thing that we know, because Duke has published a whole shelf load of writings about Stuart Hall, that Hall's work was not narrowly focused on race, nor even on race and difference. That's the book that Paul and I have done. That, that Hall's work covered everything concerning anti-capitalist, anti-colonial, anti-racist, anti-sexist 
formations. And he took close, close attention, and something Nicole knows better than I do, to close, close attention at the kinds of cultural practices through which people figure out ways to say something about themselves that they perhaps can never explain, but they'll say anyway, right? It doesn't, it just saying it is not explaining it, but saying anyway, so it's expression. So that's all a build up to, to put a question to all of us, and that is um, we did not imagine in the 1980s when we first started write, reading Stuart Hall's writing that by this time in the 21st century, of course we all thought we'd be dead because we were live fast, die young generation, but we did not imagine the extent to which race would become such a vibrantly but sometimes rigidly and narrowing standalone category of analysis. So it always had to be a category of analysis, how could it not? But it's become something that is really worrisome because it seems constantly to be the answer to the problems created through the racism that produces race. So this, that's a question I want to put to everybody. And my machine turned off, which means that my time is up. Ah, and the, the last thing I want to say is um, that when Hall and his colleagues were uh, establishing the Birmingham Center for Cultural Studies, what they did and what I think all of us who are for one reason or another within university walls, whether as visitors or as uh, employees or both, uh, is that they would roll around from seminar table to seminar table and lecture to lecture and listen, 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 and poach. There was no idea, no concept, no theory, no approach, no partial set of questions defining a traditional discipline that the people in the B Birmingham Center didn't look at really, really closely and instead of just rejecting it, ask themselves, what can we do using this as a tool for what we want to do? So those of you who suffer through my seminars know that this is how I teach. This is how I learned to be a better teacher by becoming a better reader by reading Stuart Hall. Thank you. I'm just going to say a couple of things or ask Ruthie a couple of questions and then we're going to open it up. Um, so one of the things that stood up for me, Ruthie, is how you frame the introduction to Stuart Hall through reading Hazel Carby, but also that moment in the 80s. And, I'm one, and I was just thinking about um, that as a moment where, um, you know, we talk about the Black Atlantic, but we're, people are reading, where we're reading um, across the Atlantic and what Paul Gilroy then later talks about as the Black uh, Athletic. So can you talk about that moment, that reading moment for you? Um, and I love how you frame, um, you know, kind of reading, um, it, it, you know, you demonstrated what it looked like to, to, to read poorly, to kind of, as the group was picking out just certain ideas or extracting certain points for their own, for allegiances or for specific political moments. Um, how how do you think that then plays into where you where you leave us with this moment where we read Stuart Hall as all about race and kind of miss all these other kind of critical analyses of power? I'm wondering how you know if you can talk more about those kind of linkages between that moment when we're talking about um, a type of scholarship forming around kind of black critical theory, black cultural studies. Um, and how certain re certain scholars, specifically mm -hmm. Stuart Hall, get extracted in, in specific ways. And also, I mean, Robert, Cedric Robinson, you've done so much work on him, and people often f miss the Marxism and black Marxism. <laughs> and, so can you just talk a little bit more about, about, yeah. about that? Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I use the work of people who stopped talking to each other 35 or 40 years ago, um, which is a shame. They should have kept talking. So what? What has happened? I wish I could account for it. 
I mean, this is why I left it as a question. Mm -hmm. If I had an answer, I would type it up, <laughs> send it in. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a question, and it's a question about you know, how the circulation of so many um, uh, challenging and dynamic ways of thinking about the world become narrowed. Um, I think some people in this room mm -hmm. might say become professionalized, which mm -hmm. is a fair criticism. Mm -hmm. uh, become brands. So the, some of what I was saying uh, concerning how we would recite, you know, again, this is 30 years ago, recite and have certain terms. Mine was intervention. <laughs> I would go to a study group. And somebody would say, well, I don't really understand what so-and-so is saying about this. And I would say every time, it's an intervention. <laughs> and I thought that that explained something. I just, I just didn't get it um, for a long, 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 long time. Uh, and I'd be very frustrated and my feelings would be hurt and all of this. It wasn't just, I mean, it was comical, but it was also cracking my brain a lot. That said, I think that an entire uh, sort of constellation, is that the word I want to use? It sounds all sparkly. Kind of a diagram, I talked a little bit about reading as engineers. A, a, a kind of uh, mechanics of thought has worked for a lot of us, including me, to such an extent that we, especially many of us in the better resourced North American universities, and I work in a worse resourced one, but I used to be in a better resourced one, um, have had the opportunity to uh, not, to in some ways dominate certain discussions, which is not necessarily a, a good thing, and export to the world, okay, let me interrupt myself. We brought in like all of this European theory and read African writers and read Latin American writers and we read you know the open veins and Galliano and we read all this stuff, right? We read and read and read and some of us became better writers. Mm -hmm. We got it, but then having gotten all these things, all of these ways of thinking, one of the things that's happened is that that sort of entire capacity for thought got shaped into some more particular ways than not of thinking about race in a North American context and then exported abroad, taken up, and then s cited back. And there's a lot of recitation back and forth across the Atlantic. I mean, you've mm -hmm. seen it. And often blackness more so than just even, I mean, race yeah. gets, well, they'll say race, mm -hmm. but it's often specifically blackness. Yeah. Um, without the layers of, um, of power and, and what you said, the, how you framed it um, very beautifully when you were talking about this unpublished um, essay by Stuart Hall thinking about the Rastas and what it means to take an alien text and to rehearse um, a freedom that one has not yet experienced, right? Mm -hmm. To kind of put that into um, to practice. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that in terms of how you frame methodology. I love what you were saying about methodology. Um, and it made me connect back to your essay on abolition geography that you mentioned, mm -hmm. and, and the idea of placemaking um, as sequences of action. So can you just talk a little bit more about that? Mm -hmm. And then we can open it up here. Yeah. Okay. okay, so this is the part for any of you who have spent 15 minutes in theater now about breath. Um, and that what Bertolt Brecht and all those communist theater people, as well as many of the surrealists, um, whether or not they had anything to do with the Communist Party or Bertolt Brecht, did was to figure out, try to figure out how in every possible way to use the combination of action and interaction to think about changing the world and think about demonstrating for people how the world might be changed. So the sequence of actions that become, as it were, in a, in a Brecht staging, the play, are in the rehearsal developed by the actors watching each other. So there isn't a direct, there are directors, but there isn't a director that says, okay, go around, you do this, and Colleen, you did this, 
and all of you do this, and I'll just have you do it over and over again until you're doing what I have in my head I want to see you do. Rather, there is this collective production of the lived space that's only temporary, it's just for the purpose of the show, right, of the play, but the, it's made by the actors noticing each other's actions and constantly developing relations between themselves and among themselves until the play eventually you know, reaches uh, uh, a moment or the producer says, you gotta put it on tonight because I'm gonna turn the lights off otherwise. So it's not necessarily um, without external constraints. One of the keys to that kind of theater is that the, however much the actors present something to the audience that makes it seem to the audience that what the actors are doing is an enclosed world, they will always open that world to the audience so that the audience think about how it is even possible that a world like the world that the actors are presenting could be. Now, this kind of work is no different, fundamentally, from, say, Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, uh, which is to say um, the kind of pedagogy that takes any kind of document, let's say the bio that Nicole read about me that you can all find online, and uh, read it and then say, what, how can I make sense of a world in which something like this could be written, set up online, circulated, read out loud to a group of people on a Saturday night in, on 37th Street in Manhattan? You know, these are all questions. So it's kind of like what Bill was talking about earlier, about questioning the conditions of existence but doing so in such a way that your imagination gets busted open far enough so that you know better than to think that your experience gives you all you need to change the world, because it doesn't. Because if it did, the world wouldn't be as it is, right? right? Experience isn't enough. Consciousness is what matters. So I don't know if I answered your question, yeah. but I answered yeah. something. But I wanted to hear more about <laughs> how you were developing me methodology, because mm. that was a really powerful Methodology. Thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that so so in, in thinking, thinking, thinking about methodology, mm -hmm. right? So methodology for we who are card-carrying members of the, of the research sciences mm -hmm. is how research should proceed, mm -hmm. right? So it's theory, object, method. It's like it's not really that highfalutin, methodology, how research should be proceed. So I thought, well, how does this connect with, with theater and Brecht, and how does it connect with Hall, and how does it connect with all of the things that, that make me able to think? And the answer is that methodology is a sequence of actions, right? And it's a sequence of actions, think about it, and you put them in sequence, and the sequence of actions produce something to which you then apply another sequence of actions that produce something to which you apply another sequence of actions and then ta-da. So it's just like rehearsal. So that's, that's, what that's it, it. Yeah. that's it. That's fantastic. Yeah. So um, I'm sure we have questions. Does anyone have the water pitcher? I think the person who, um, someone poured the water and I think walked off with the pitcher. <laughs> oh, you're busy. He's busy. <laughs> you are. You're, you're, thank you. He stole the one. <laughs> Questions? So, um, oh, that's very loud. Uh, um, you mentioned uh, race as a category, you said, um, has become, um, as a category of analysis, very rigid in your perspective and uh, limiting. Uh, and so I'm wondering uh, if you could speak to how intellectually, culturally, discursively, we could make it more flexible and broaden it somehow. 
understand our struggles to inhabit us are all like useful and vital categories, except for when we get to the edge of the category and say, and this only applies to these people in this way and not to anybody else. Or one cannot speak about certain conditions if one does not inhabit that category. And that's what I mean about the rigidity. Um, uh, and I have more to say about this that some of you are really sick of hearing me say, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, as you know, we, we're living in this peculiar um, version of capitalism, saving capitalism from capitalism, the, a peculiar, which is a particular uh, round of imperialism, particular rounds of uh, deepening inequality on the Earth's surface, and you know, last couple of days, climate change is you know rising, rising, rising as um, uh, a problem that many people are well aware of, but it now makes the news in the West. Right. So, with all of this, what is the what are the conditions that we are struggling with and through? On the one hand globalization takes the form it takes so that somebody like capitalist tool Darren Walker, the head of the Ford Foundation, will say, isn't it great that 181 global CEOs had a meeting in which they said we should make our corporations more responsive to the needs of the earth, and now it's our, our job, we the people, to make 181 corporations, 7 billion people on this planet, 181 corporations to hold them to their promises, say that and at the same time say, but people fighting against the new jails in New York City are the enemies of progress and they're extremists and they have no nuance. The same person said this in a single piece of writing. All right, now, here, what is the, what is the connection with where I'm going about race? And it's right here. The advantage to global capitalism to breaking up the uh, jurisdiction and potential solidarity of all of the people affected by global capitalism are enormous. The more jurisdictions, the better. They have the software to make sure they evade taxes. So if we added a new country tomorrow that had a 99% tax on corporate profit, those guys wouldn't pay it because their software will make sure that no transaction actually happens there, even if 90% of their transactions happen there, right? We know this. So what's laid over the world is this constant devolution, devolution of jurisdictions, you know, four jails in New York City instead of one, um, uh, more cities than ever before, more polities than ever before, more courts than ever before, uh, it increased jails, Brexit, you know, the UK leaving the EU, all of these things, this devolution makes it really, really just constantly easier for capital in the aggregate to do its thing, even though individual capitalists are going to trip and fall when Brexit happens, and will trip and fall when the big jail closes if the new jails open, mm -hmm. and so forth. So in that context, with this constant devolutionary pressure, it is not surprising to me that many people feel as though the only way for us to do political work from the ground up is to do it in extremely demarcated collectivities. And one of the ways that that extreme demarcation happens, especially in North America, and by that I mean actually the US and Canada, is under the aegis of race. To an, an, another degree, indigeneity, but race and indigeneity, and this kind of thinking rather than expanding consciousness, which it should do, all of this struggle can expand consciousness, is uh, constraining people's real ability to do work collectively under the aegis of what we used to call internationalism and might call uh, internationalism again. That a certain kind of narrow, very rigid specificity is just shutting people down. It's shutting down what people do, how they do it, why they do it. 
So there's a meme that came out a few years ago. And it was, when black lives matter, everyone lives better. It says everyone, right? So while on the one hand, truthfully and correctly, people who raise the aegis or the ha hashtag black lives matter refuse to say, no, I'll really say all lives matter, because the point was to argue against the slaughter of black people, not to argue for the slaughter of anyone else, but to argue against the slaughter of black people. And so when Black Lives Matter, Everybody Lives Better was a way of saying, if we stop the slaughter of black people, maybe everything will get better. But saying all lives matter is not the way to do it. You see, in that meme, the expansion is possible, while specificity remains front and center in the struggle. And that's what I'm talking about when I say that race has become the standalone category of analysis and further that the problem we should be addressing anyway is racism, not race. Are you about to tell us to stop? No, I was about to say one more question. Oh, okay. You were looking so expensive there. One more question? Thank you, this is a super stimulating talk and uh, I think you put a lot of words to stuff I've been struggling with for a while. Uh, I, I have one, it's funny when you're describing back uh, in another period when you're, you're in kind of political education meetings and, and the practice seems to be grounded in uh, assimilation of the text meaning or, or recitation for, for some kind of battle down the line. It sounded like a meeting I was in earlier this week. Uh, and I think that we're, we're really still struggling with coming up with forms of education that, that train us how to think through problems collectively together rather than uh, just the assimilation of a line that we can then dispense at, at the first available occasion. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of wondering for, for you what in the organizing spaces you're in, what, are there any kind of concrete practices that you found have helpful uh, in terms of structuring political education? Anything that, that you find is, is helpful to kind of encourage precisely that, that kind of thinking? That's a great question. Um, the main thing for me, more than anything else, is listening. And as you can see, I like to talk. <laughs> so I have to talk against myself as well as argue against myself. So listening and arguing against yourself are the two things. But listening. So there's a guy who teaches in the Southwest, maybe at ASU, called Alan Eladio Gomez. And Alan was a grad student at the University of Texas, Austin, many years ago when I went and keynoted a conference on uh, I can't remember the name of the organization, but anyway, it's Border Studies, right? And uh, Alan just said to me kind of offhand, oh, it was really nice to be in your session, and it's so different from most of the seminars and meetings I'm in, where for most people, the difference, uh, the opposite of talking is waiting. And that is so true. That is so true, and it's so destructive of so much politics. So that's one thing. And then the other thing has to do with the rehearsal. If somebody says, hey, why don't we do this, then starting to talk through what the doing is, and it, I don't mean a blueprint, I mean like try it on, uh, is, is something else that I think I've found has been extremely good for political education. For example, for uh, some years ago, I, I worked for a long time with a group of people, most of whom are mothers, most of whom black mothers, of adults and, and juveniles caught up in California's criminal justice system. And one of the things we did as part of the group's work was to go to court with each other, right? And in going to court with each other, people actually, the purpose was to go and listen and watch. So everyone became a better analyst for the just simple thing of buddying up and going to court with your friend, right? And making sure that nobody was ever in court without a friend. So listening and watching and, and listening. And I'll also say that um, in those days, uh, the people in, our, in that organization, I, I'm not a mother, I never was, although I have many children. Um, <laughs> But the people in that organization were completely unabashed 
about the fact that I showed up with my big vocabulary and my graduate school dropoutness and all that, and they were like, great. Then you know how to use libraries. You know how to get books. You guys go and find this out and come back and give a report. And so come back and have these workshops. And then we would do the workshops, and then the mothers would come in and they'd say, oh, I was in the library the other day, and I saw this thing on the librarian's table that might be an interesting thing for you. And I mean, this is how I learned so many things. And I don't mean like raw materials. I mean like really great theoretical approaches to problems, mm -hmm. right? Because we were intellectual comrades. Mm -hmm. And we listened to each other. And we, another way that we listened to each other, I got beat up the first time I ever gave a talk at the Grad Center of the City University of New York many years ago. I talked about how the, this organization used to begin and end its meetings with prayer. I, I'm, I don't believe in any, you know, <laughs> you are my higher power. You are, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, this is what we did. And I realized that what was happening is the prayers at the beginning and end, because they were out loud. It wasn't like quiet, it wasn't, there was no Quaker stuff. Um, uh, out loud is that people were setting and summarizing the agendas for the meetings. So at the beginning, it set an agenda, and then we'd have the agenda, but we knew there was this other agenda. It's like, oh Lord, let us, da, 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 da. that was an agenda. And then we would have the agenda, your case, your case, your case. And then we get to the end, we stand up, hold hands again, and then somebody would, would pray, and it was like, this is what we didn't resolve. Right? We summarized the agenda, and, the, and this level we didn't resolve it, so we went out. And I could have, and it's not my heroism, this is just like the report, I could have shut my ears because I'm not into praying. But I learned like, how to be like, in, the, in that and of that community, not by tolerating, but by listening. It's just listening. That's all. Yeah. So listen. Wrap up. So join me in thanking Ruthie for stimulating us in the hallways. Thank you. And challenging us to listen better. I mean, it is <laughs> so critical to like every aspect of our lives, right? So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I just want to remind you last minute that Word Up Bookstore and is still here with books. They've got bills, sure. books, bills, design books. Thank you for coming now. Thank you for the People's Forum for making this space available to us. And I promised our friends at Verso Books, since Hazel Carby came up, that uh, we had originally, when we started planning this, hoped to have her here for this. Uh, but she's coming to the Schomburg on November 8th. So if you want to come and hear her speak, please go out to that. Thanks again to all of today's speakers. Have a good night, everybody. I'm not sure I know what you mean. Well, I mean, it's like watching Washington, for example, and then uh, and there's something there that I would follow beyond. Would it be beneficial or harmful? It could be beneficial. You have to be careful, though. I mean, you have yeah, yeah, you have very good you have very good sense. Because I'm always uh, I'm always doing drawing.